Okay, today we're gonna to look at section 5.1, which is all about, well, it's about the introduction to some basic uh, simplification and some solving of equations. So, you should have your uh, identities sort of solidified in your mind. If not, get out your paper, your reference sheet. We can be using that today to help us. But again, the goal is very soon for you to have those identities in your head so that we don't have to keep consulting all our sheet. Okay, so what we're gonna do first is I've just got a couple random examples and I'll look at a couple from the book and we're gonna be simplifying. So we're gonna take an expression like this. And we're gonna simplify that. Now, when I look at that, well, first of all, it's kind of scary looking, but when I look at that, I immediately think about factoring because both of these terms have a sign in them. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull that sign out, fact, regular factoring, I'm gonna take a sign out. Now remember, this is sign cubed. So if I take one out, I'm gonna be left with two left, right? There's gonna be two left. And then if I take out this, I'm gonna be left with cosine squared. Now, there should be bells going off in your head. What's that? That is the big, big, big Pythagorean identity. Sine squared plus cosine squared is always one. So this whole mess simplifies down to just sine x because that's just one. How cool is that? All right, let's try this one. Sorry about that, I copied that wrong. I've got a fraction, but that's not it. Here it is. All right, now, when you look at that, and, and you're algebra students, I mean, you've all taken algebra, you look at that and the first thing I think you probably think about is foiling that, multiplying that together. So let's do that and see what happens. So we get secant squared minus secant plus secant minus one. Oh, by the way, when I am saying this out loud, I'm saying secant squared, but I would never write a secant or a tangent or a cosine or anything without the variable attached. So please do not ever neglect writing down your variable. That's going to become important because in the not so distant future, we're going to have problems that have more than one variable. So if you start leaving out the variables, you're not going to know what goes with a what. Secant by itself means nothing. It must have an angle attached. So be sure that you are including the variable. All right, that's what I got on top. What's on the bottom sine squared? Okay, now what happens on the top? Well, that cancels out. All right, now wait a minute, wait a minute. There's something kind of tickling my brain right now. I have the big Pythagorean identity, but there are two other versions of this that involve squares and ones. Remember that? You've got one that says one plus tangent squared is secant squared. And you got one that says one plus cotangent squared is cosecant squared. Now, I don't have either one of these in that problem, but I want you to look at what I have and I want you to think about this one. It's got the secant squared and the one. And if I rearranged that so that I had secant squared minus one, wouldn't that equal tangent squared? Doesn't tangent squared equal secant squared minus one? So when I look at this problem, my numerator is tangent squared. Now, 
what do I know about tangent squared? Well, it's many things. It's y over x. It's uh, opposite over adjacent. It's the reciprocal or cotangent. But it's also sine squared over cosine squared. So this tangent squared is sine squared over cosine squared. And then the whole shebang is divided by sine squared. I always get a little freaked out by all this division of fractions, so I prefer to think of it as multiplication by the reciprocal. So this is sine squared over cosine squared times one over sine squared. It's divided by sine squared, so it would be times one over sine squared. These are gonna cancel. I've got 1 over cosine squared, which is secant squared. So this mess right here, believe it or not, look at that. Believe it or not, that simplified down to just secant squared. You guys got to admit, this is, this is pretty cool stuff. This is kind of fun. Let's do one more, and then I'll get a couple out of the book. All right, so now I've got something that looks like this, cosine over 1 minus sine minus sine over cosine. Now, again, you're all good algebra students. You all have had arithmetic for years and years and years, and you know when you subtract fractions, you must get a common denominator. So I'm subtracting fractions, I must get a common denominator. So I guess my common denominator will be 1 minus sine times cosine. So I'm going to multiply this one by a cosine. Remember, I've got to do it on the top and the bottom. And I'm going to multiply this one by a 1 minus sine, top and bottom. So now I have one giant fraction, and on the bottom is cosine times 1 minus sine. Now, what do I have on the top? Well, let's see. We've got cosine squared minus, okay, now you're subtracting all this, so we're going to do some dis distributing here. So minus sine plus sine squared. Negative sine times 1 and negative sine times negative sine. Now, you got those bells going off in your head again? You should, because you've got a cosine squared plus a sine squared. And anytime you have a cosine squared plus a sine squared, you're going to make it 1. So 1 minus sine over cosine, 1 minus sine. This is a 1 minus sine. And then on the bottom, you'll have the same thing I've had. Now, see that right there? That will cancel with that, leaving you with 1 over cosine or secant. Now, whether you simplify this to secant or not is up to you. A lot of people prefer to leave everything in terms of sines and cosines because they're kind of the basic pieces of the trigonometry puzzle. So either one of these would be considered okay. Don't get hung up about that. But isn't it amazing? Look at our original problem. That was this mess here in the black. And it boiled all the way down to just secant. You have to admit that that is pretty awesome. Now, I'm going to look in my book and just grab a couple of examples. Um, to make sure that you know what you're doing when you do your homework. And then we've got one other kind of problem to look at today, but not much more. All right, I'm looking in my book and I'm looking at uh, number uh, six. So I'm looking at number six and it says tangent 
pi over 2 minus theta, remember that's 90, equals negative 5.32. So it says find cotangent theta. Please do not make this hard. When you see that 90, that pi over 2 radians, 90 degrees, you should immediately be thinking co-function. And we know that the tangent of 90 minus theta is the same as the cotangent of theta. These are, that, this equality here is a co-function relationship. So the answer is just negative 5.32. <clears throat> now, there will be people who sweat and agonize over that. Don't. You need to know your identities and know that the tangent of 90 minus an angle is the cotangent of that angle, period. And that relationship exists not just for tan and cotan, but for all of the, all of the uh, uh, co-functions. All right, now I'm looking at 18 which says secant negative x times cosine negative x. Well, first of all, first of all, what happens to these negatives? These are the two odd, excuse me, the two even functions. These are the even functions. So this is just secant x, and this is just cosine x. They're both even. So the negatives are disregarded. Now, what's the relationship between secant and cosine? Secant and cosine are reciprocals. What happens when you multiply reciprocals? What happens when you multiply 2 thirds times 3 halves? When you multiply reciprocals, you just get 1. And so the answer to this question is 1. All right, one more, number 24. Directions say simplify. So here we go. Going to use our identities and our knowledge of algebra and simplify. 1 plus tan over 1 plus cotan. Um, there are actually a couple of different ways. Oh, actually, I, there are always multiple ways to do a problem. You know that's what makes math so fun. Um, when I see tangent and cotangent, I um, think about the quotient functions. So maybe I would think of this as 1 plus sine over cosine and one plus cosine over sine. All right, I'm gonna do it this way and then I'm gonna show you another way to do it that might also pop into your head. But let's suppose we started this way. Now, I know we have an identity that says one plus tangent squared is secant squared. The Pythagorean identities come from the Pythagorean theorem. And in the Pythagorean theorem, it's a squared plus b squared plus c squared. So this is not an identity. Please don't think that 1 plus tangent is secant. It's not. 1 plus tangent squared is secant squared. And that is the way you have to think about it. So we're not going to be able to rewrite that as anything except, well, one of the ways we can rewrite it as 1 plus sine over cosine, 1 plus cosine over sine. Now, this is a what we call a complex fraction. It's a big fraction made up of smaller fractions. You can do this in a lot of different ways, but because these identities involve so much writing, so much space on the paper, the quickest fastest, most efficient way to get this cleaned up is to multiply every single part of the complex fraction by the common denominator of the whole shebang. So the common denominator is sine cosine. 
So I'm going to multiply everything by sine cosine. Now, at first glance, you're thinking, oh my gosh, Mrs. Ford, that's going to make a mess. Well, it is in the very beginning, but it's going to clean up very nicely. So I multiply everything by sine cosine. The reason that I did that is because now my denominators of my original fractions will be gone. This cosine will cancel here. And on top, I'm left with sine cosine plus sine squared. And on the bottom, I'll be left with sine cosine. Now the sines will cancel, so plus cosine squared. Now you're still thinking, ah, that's a mess. Well, if you look at the numerator, you can factor out a sign. And that would leave you with a cosine plus a sign. If I took out the sign, that would leave me with cosine plus sign. This is not an identity. Remember the Pythagorean identities are squared, squared, squared. So that's nothing. Now on the bottom, I can do the same thing, only I'm gonna pull out cosine. And that's gonna leave me with sine plus cosine. Now, what happens, guys? What really beautiful thing happens? Gone. Remember, addition is commutative, so those are the same thing. And we're left with sine over cosine, which is tangent. So that thing right there, as unbelievable as it seems, reduce us down to tangent. Now I'm going to do the problem again, like I said, but even if you don't uh, um, want to do it this way, be aware of this strategy. Multiplying every part of the complex fraction by the common denominator of the whole thing. All right, so another option you would have, and maybe you've been thinking about is, that you know that the cotangent is the reciprocal of the tangent. So you could change your cotangent into one over tangent. Now, you still have a complex fraction but your common denominator now is just tangent. These denominators are one, that's tangent. So you're gonna multiply everything by tangent. So on the top, we have tangent plus tangent squared. And on the bottom, we have tangent plus one. Now, can you see where we're going? It's very similar, just a little smaller, very similar to what happened over here. We can take a tangent out of the top and we'll be left with one plus tangent. We have tangent plus one on the bottom. Those will cancel and leave us with tangent, which is what we got before. So one of the great things about you guys working together is that you can look at each other's ideas because that's an idea and the first way I did it was an idea and there's probably lots of other ideas that you could come up with. All right, so we have one more thing to do and that is to solve a couple of equations, trigonometric equations. Now, I know you did a little of that in the last chapter, but now our equations are just gonna be a little bit bigger. The ideas are gonna be the same, but the equations are gonna be a little bit bigger. So here's our first one. And we're solving from zero to two pi. And I think we're gonna do it without a calculator. I'll have to get into it and see. Here we go. That's a mess. Now 
well. Let's see what we got with cotangent. What is cotangent? Is there another way to write cotangent? Cotangent is cosine over sine. Oh, okay, all right. Now let's multiply both sides by sine. I am solving this equation. So just like I would multiply both sides by two, I'm gonna multiply both sides by sine and that will leave me with cosine cubed equals cosine. Now there might be someone out there who is thinking, oh, let's divide by cosine. You can't do that because you aren't allowed to divide by a variable. Now you're, here I multiplied both sides by sine. That's perfectly okay. I can't divide both sides by sine or cosine or anything on the off chance it might be zero. Division by zero, as you know, is not allowed. So don't ever divide by a variable, okay? We're not gonna divide by a variable. So instead of dividing by cosine, let's subtract cosine. Because if we subtract it, now we can factor it out, which accomplishes the same thing as division, only it's legit. So we subtract the cosine over and then factor it out. Now, just like with regular equation solving, we'll set both of these equal to zero, so cosine equals zero, or cosine squared equals one, which means cosine equals plus or minus one, taking the square root, just like I do in regular equations. Now, get out my trusty unit circle. You might have this memorized. I don't, so I have to use my unit circle all the time. And I know these points. And I want to know where the cosine is zero. Now remember, cosine is associated with x. x is zero here and here. So the answer to this part of the problem is pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. Remember, I am, oh, I erased, I'm answering in radians. So I'll say up here, which is pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. Okay? Now, where is the cosine positive one or negative one? Well, over here, it's positive one, right? So x is zero. Now, zero and two pi are the same angle. They're in the same place. Our directions are generally written like this. So we include zero, but not two pi. If 2 pi were included, if both of these had our equal twos, then 2 pi would be an answer down there also. And then negative 1 is over here at pi. All right, are we ready? Because now we got a tricky part. Let's go back and look at the original equation. I'm going to erase my unit circle here. And I'm going to look at the original equation because whatever happens, whatever happens, I can't have extraneous roots. So this was the original equation. Obviously, you have a sign in the denominator. Anytime that the sign is zero, it's not gonna work. So these are the answers we got legitimately solving the equation, but we have to make sure they make sense in the original. So here we go. Where is the sine zero? Sine is y, 
sine is zero here and here. So these two answers cannot be part of the solution because if you put zero or pi into the original equation, it would be undefined. So the answer is pi over two and three pi over two. That's it. All right, so now I've got one more. Um, to solve. Let's look at this one. Alright, so we have 2 sine squared plus sine equals 1, and we are finding all solutions. This is another one of those things that we need to know how to do for calculus. So we're going to find all the solutions. And um, let's go ahead and do this one in degrees. We'll do this one in degrees so we get some practice with that too. All right, so take a look at that equation. And I'm old and I do this for a living. So the first thing I see is a quadratic equation. I see an equation with squared variable, like ax squared plus bx plus c. So the first thing I want to do is get it set equal to zero. So it's in standard quadratic form. This factors, believe it or not, Whatever you put in the front, well, let me back up a minute. If, can you see that that equation is exactly the same style as this equation? Only instead of having an A or an N or an X, we have sine X. So we have sine x squared, sine x, and then just minus 1. If this were your equation, I have no doubt that you would all be able to factor it. Let me double check and make sure I got it factored correctly. Okay. You would factor it like that, and then you would solve. Well, this is going to do exactly the same thing. Only instead of the a's, we've got sine squares. So it's going to be two sine, or not, not sine, we have regular sine. Instead of the a's, we have sine x. So we have two sine x minus one and sine x plus one. If you foil this back together, you would get two sine squared plus two sine minus one sine, and then minus one. See how that works? These guys factor just like regular equations factor. So that would say sine x equals one half, set that equal to zero, and sine x equals negative one. Now, that negative 1, I just talked about that one. The sign is y, and y is negative down here. So if I'm doing it in degrees, I'll say 270. If I'm doing it in radians, I'll say 3 pi over 2. That one's easy. Now, where is the sign 1 half? Well, if you have your whole unit circle memorized, then you probably know where the sine is one half. But if you don't have it memorized, remember that it has to be in quadrant one or quadrant two because sine is y and y is positive up here. That's a positive number. So if the sine is one half, then that means my triangle would look like that, 
and that's a 30 degree angle. On your unit circle, if you do it that way, that's the point root three comma, or root three over two comma one half. For me, I'm gonna say the sine is one half because it's opposite over um, hypotenuse. If you're using the unit circle, then you're gonna have the same coordinates as me, you're just gonna have them in fraction form. So the sine is one half at 30 degrees, and the sine is one half at, ooh, that's no good. The sine is one half at 150 degrees. So X is um, 30 or 150 or pi over six and five pi over six if you're doing it in radians. Now, we got one thing we haven't covered. This whole deal about all. This, these are the answers if we go around our circle one time. But we are not restricted to one time. We need all of the coterminal angles. So in other words, if 30 is an answer, then so is, all, or so are, all of the angles formed by adding a revolution or subtracting a revolution. So 30, 390. 30, negative 330. So we can add one revolution or two revolutions on and on forever and ever. N is a whole number. So any multiple of 360, any, any whole number, multiple of 360, added or subtracted from 30, will produce an angle in the same place. Here's 30, here's negative 330. 30 minus 360. Same thing with 150, and the same thing with 270. When you add and subtract revolutions, you're just looking at other ways to write the same angle, that same position. So we add or subtract multiples of the revolution. If we're answering in radians, then we're gonna take all of these answers, all of these, and we're gonna add or subtract two pi n. Because in radians, a revolution is two pi. So you would add 2 pi or you would subtract 2 pi from each of these once or twice or three times or four times, however many you needed. What I'm saying is this equation has infinitely many solutions. Any angle that's here, here, or here, any of these angles, however you want to name them, is an answer to this equation. I am not worried about extraneous roots. Remember our last example? We had an extraneous root. I'm not worried about it here because I don't have a denominator of any kind. Sine, remember, sine is never undefined, sine's always fine. If we had, if this equation had been done in terms of tangents, then I would have to look at my answers carefully because tangent has asymptotes. And any angle that's an asymptote is not going to be allowed in a tangent problem. And the same with the secant and, and everything that has asymptotes. So, no extraneous roots here, no denominator of any kind to worry about, uh, no asymptotes to worry about, so that's it.
All right, well, I hope you have as much fun with these problems as I had. Good luck on your practice.